So first of all, I want to thank Jean Marie for inviting me to come out here to Northwind. It's been about like four years since I've been out here during an exhibition. Uh, the last one was uh, Small Expressions Worth uh, Exhibition, I believe is what it's called. Um, so it's, it's good to be back and especially with a theme that I also am interested in when I'm doing my own artwork and that's Earth Matters. It's a big theme, right? And we all can relate to it in, in some way. Um, Glad to see such a variety of work and the great number of artists who submitted work to this show and the, the theme, the title, Earth Matters. The exhibition's title is self-explanatory, yet the show ranges from more traditional interpretations of the theme to the political, to the unexpected and beyond. The theme allowed for an inclusive offering of work and varied responses from artists, which I believe should be experienced and shared. However, I had the difficult job of selecting which works I thought were of high quality and essential to the show and which works were not. This ended up being about half of the artwork submitted, and at least I thought it was until I talked to Jay and he said there was over 200 people that submitted work, and I think we're down to like 80 uh, pieces. Um, to reduce the number of works even further in order to allow for more space would be to reduce the reasons why Earth matters, hence the abundance of work still found in the exhibition today. And yet at the same time, I realize the dramatic irony of the abundance, which could be argued as to the point of excess as it relates to overproduction, overconsumption, and overpopulation of the Earth. Those realities often seem far removed from the Olympic Northwest, where the untouched Edenistic wilderness is vast and thriving, and, it grow, and its growth attempts to reclaim every machine surface with each new drop of rain. Yes, originally from Wisconsin, I never thought that I would have to shovel moss in place of <laughs> snow from the sidewalk. And so it grows, as does the art made from the hands of artists who have thrived from this growth, sharing it with us today. We witness the creations of that growth and celebrate them. So thank you artists that are here. Whether it's been through my experiences teaching at the college, viewing local art galleries and art centers, or visiting the art museums, I continue to have an affinity for the art of the Northwest. Green sensibilities find their way into the work, which in my opinion is wonderful to see. Though I have to admit that the color green has still not grown on me, and it's <laughs> everywhere in the Northwest including in here. Just look around, you, know, you can find it, okay. Um, you can't miss it. So um, this I knew would be a challenge in judging this particular exhibition. So if your artwork was rejected and it has the color green in it, <laughs> don't feel bad, rather blame it on my poor taste. I know you will either way. All right. As a juror, I evaluate each artwork based on many criteria and alter that criteria according to each work. At the most basic level, deciding whether to move on or to, contribute, uh, to continue looking at a work of an art implies a, a judgment about its worth. When estimating an artwork's value, I look at visual aesthetics, creative originality, conceptual content, excellence of formalism based on the elements and principles of art, presence of beauty, importance to society, excellent of, excellence of craftsmanship and technique, appropriate labor and time involved in creating, excellence compared to other artworks by the artist, which is a disadvantage if I already know an artist's work, because I'm thinking about this. So, um, intensity of emotional expression or restraint thereof as related to the concept, use of historical reference to events and or art, appeal of subject matter, depth of subject matter, and finally the distinctiveness and use of style. It's a lot of things to be thinking about when looking at an artwork, but trust me, they're all there sort of in the back of my mind when I'm viewing or, or looking at a work of art. Other things to consider, titles. So it's, I'm gonna go into titles in, in just a bit here. Um, that's something that, that, that is very important to, to uh, look at. And so when I was during this show, 
it was it was somewhat difficult because all I get to see is the artwork itself and not the title unless I sort of turn the piece around and then it gets into the whole thing of, oh did I see a signature or artist name in there and it's like well I already know some people's work but uh, you know that becomes difficult but titles for me are extremely important uh, in visual art and I'm going to talk about that so a title can often say a lot about a work it's the artist's chance to be brilliant and elevate an artwork to another level of interpretation. If it's not thought out well or too vague, then it can often detract from the work or sometimes worse cause frustration, unless that is the objective of the artwork. I find that we are often intrigued and feel a need to understand what an artwork is. After all, art in its most basic definition is creative visual language. We can love a flower without the need to understand it. But if that flower is altered by an artist, put in a gallery and displayed with frame, we often want to know the reason why, and a title is often our first clue in understanding. Presentation is an art form in itself. I don't think many artists give this enough thought. An artwork could be easily excused from a show if its presentation is poorly considered. If an artist doesn't consider the art form of presentation in an appropriate manner, I don't consider their art in an appropriate manner. Uh, signatures are a part of this. As a general rule, don't sign your work where it can be seen. Galleries and museums make placards that have your name on them and a collector will be sure to tell their friends whom their acquisition is by. A signature usually only detracts from the viewing experience, and unless you're an extremely noteworthy artist, it can seem presumptuous and distracting. In some cases, a large signature can make a conceptual statement, which may include irony. So there's always exceptions to these rules and thoughts. I want you to be thinking about them. All right. So at times I felt conflicted about which works to select. I spent over four hours judging this exhibition, and that still didn't feel like enough time. Good art like good music gets better with repeated engagement. But time isn't a luxury we can always afford, and the show must be hung. If I only had more information about each work to help inform my decision process, it would have been less of a challenge. I may not be fully aware of the content or iconography that each artist and their work references. However, in contrast, shouldn't an artwork be able to speak for itself? Shouldn't I be attracted to an artwork based on its use of aesthetics and content and evaluate how beautifully and harmoniously they support, they support each other in one sitting? In the end, I'm happy with the decisions I've made, though I would have liked to have been able to honor more artists with awards. This show displays artworks that vary in style, medium, concept, and format. It seems fitting that the works I selected for awards are also quite varied. I will now discuss a few of the artworks that I thought were exceptional and provide some of my reasoning and interpretations. Even though I was unable to offer them award, they were in contention for an award, and I believe they are deserving of recognition in this talk. Helga's artwork entitled Delta appears to be a reference to the mouth of a river, yet it doesn't take the triangular form of the Greek letter. Instead, the artwork focuses on variations of line that echo the path of a meandering river. It reminds us to enjoy the path wherever it leads as the dots of paint and sinuous lines delight us with the pure joy of paint and color. The wood has been turned beautifully round into a perfect storm. So, sorry, perfect form. <laughs> this book is on my mind, sorry. Okay, uh, Delta echoes the shapes of stones found in a riverbed that have formed over millennia. It is perhaps reminding us that time has no existence. Just as the river doesn't have a past or future, it just flows eternally even at what seems like the end. So enjoy the beauty of the moment and the water that shapes and gives life to all. Enjoy this beautiful work of art. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, so this is Abstract in Mud and Stone. Though I wish it had a more poetic title, I appreciate the beauty of the, its composition. Christina's Abstract in Mud and Stone delights the viewer with varied textures that are intensely alluring. Here's a photo that I can stare at for a while. The detail is amazing and the presentation is dead on. The monochromatic image heightens our awareness of the subtle changes in textures 
and at the same time suggest a frozen moment in time that has been documented. The image is devoid of color and life. I find it to be a grim reminder of the harshness of the seasons and even more the universe. It suggests that water once flowed here and may never again, which is not unlike the photos of the surface of the planet Mars. It's the unfortunate state that the entire Earth will most likely revert to eventually like our moon. The image has a timeless quality that could also be read as primordial, referencing the early mud and stone that supported early forms of terrestrial life. This earth matters to all that has evolved from it. So Robin Johnson, the, the work that I've selected for Robin Johnson was Moon Over Bay, which is this photograph over here on the wall. Robin's photo in this exhibition are poetry. She has another one that sort of caught my eye. That's a small little one. And there's silhouetted deer there. So um, she might have had another one. I'm not sure. But at first glance, um, sorry, Robin's photos in this exhibition are poetry. Moon Over Bay was the one that caught my eye in particular. At first glance, the photo appears to be a quiet and contemplative scene that speaks of the serenity of night. Yet after further consideration, the stillness is broken by the resonance of the nocturne light. The symmetry found within the image takes on an almost iconic quality with the moon as the illuminator. The trees in the foreground are so thin, weather-worn, and seemingly frail, yet they rise for the miraculous celestial event that has recently been unveiled by the passing clouds in dramatic fashion. The sea below also rises for the moon as the tides pull which is emphasized by the reflection of light. The moon is full and round, instantly reminding us of the larger sphere we ride on. The darkness of the image is akin to the unknown. It's suggestive of the mysteries of life and the universe. All that matters is the light that lies beyond our vision. Um, so this is Christina, is it? Uh, no, sorry, uh, uh, this is Alyssa Gries. Uh, is that right, am I pronouncing your name? Grises. Okay, sorry. And so um, thank you for, for this artwork. But uh, Alyssa has offered us at least a gateway to what lies beyond our vision in her work entitled The Portal. Though it may not be directly related to the theme of Earth Matters, it may suggest a way to or from this far removed planet that we call home. The minute this work's imagery appears familiar, it appears unfamiliar. At, the, at one moment, it's of this world, and then next, it's otherworldly. Its large, symmetrical, luminous surface beckons, yet the embossed and machine fabricated tentacles of a new age are a slight cause for hesitation and uncertainty in taking the voyage. I've become a lost traveler with no other way out. The surface and details are just far too alluring and I'm too damn curious. I'm going to take the plunge. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. So it's a wonderful piece. And I know that when I originally was looking at this, I was told it could be hung in the corner. Or I saw it more in a flattened version on the floor, you know, as all the artworks were sort of positioned on the floor. So it's, it's interesting to see it in the corner. As we also now have this mirrored effect that I didn't notice before. So that there's something there, too, to maybe talk about. All right. So this piece is by Les Schnick. And Les is here. Um, so, and uh, he entitled it Roots. Les tor Les's torturous and carefully crafted sculpture entitled Roots makes me feel guilty for ever using wood to construct something. <laughs> it must haunt him as well as the object appears to be made predominantly of wood by his own hands. An alternate tip title for this epic horror sculpture could have been Saw 9. <laughs> An old growth massive tree has been sliced down the middle in rip saw fashion into quarters by the rising infrastructure of human occupancy. To add injury to insult, the cold gray buildings are also made of milled wood planks. Oh, the horror. <laughs> the next part of this torturous crime scene is evident when the head of the tree was decapitated and discarded and its, as its trunk, trunked neck 
was skinned down to its inner core and left raw and exposed to rot from the inside out. The tree's limbs have been guillotined off and they bleed red at the end. That's right. If you didn't already know, trees also bleed red blood. In the subterranean realm, we find that the tree's roots have been bound and imprisoned in medieval stocks like fashion, which are also disturbingly made of wood. These roots run deeper into a place that can't be seen, which is possibly a sign of hope for successive generations connected by vast root systems. Though the title roots may also imply that the life form and tortured soul of a tree is embedded into every building that we dwell comfortably in. So when you go home tonight, remember that if your roof falls in on you, it perhaps is the sweet justice of tree karma. <laughs> All right, Diana. All right. Uh, Diana has documented young criminal furs in mugshot fashion <laughs> in unsanctioned restoration mugshots. Each fur in the gridded group is presented as a unique individual having its own swagger. They are gestural stick figures with attitudes that are bound by the shackles of the pot they were placed in. On closer inspection, it appears that a few may even be presenting a bird. It's a humorous satire about nature's irresponsible actions of growing in places that people have deemed inappropriate for whatever reason. <laughs> These pesky youngsters are such a nuisance and impede progress. All they do is stand around lazily growing. They get in the way of our view of the strait or mountains, drink the water on our land, use up all the sunlight they can, blocking it from our sun porches, harbor noisy woodpeckers, litter, litter their needles everywhere, and they don't even pay their fair share of taxes on the land they use. Good God, what a drain on society. <laughs> I guess it serves them right that we eventually cut them down, make canvas stretchers from their bodies, <laughs> and then publicly shame them by making them support their image with their said crime branded on it. What justice. Diana's work is powerful in its concept, presentation, and environmental impact. It is directly related to the land art movement and tells us that it's, it, it's the environment that matters or that makes earth matter. I, for one, am glad to see these little furs challenge the system and hope that they will be given a second chance to grow up big and strong and spread their little seeds all over unsanctioned lands once they are released. All right, so um, I did see Stephen, Stephen Yates come in earlier, and so he's here, and I was going to talk about his large painting, which probably doesn't need to be taken off the wall, uh, called Bay Storm. Stephen's Bay Storm is a painter's painting. The scale is so that one is allowed to walk into the paradoxical space. I'm so lost in the material that it's difficult to discern where sky actually meets horizon. The lack of atmospheric perspective in the distant landscape of the bay challenges my perspective even further. What is illusion? The sea, the reflection of sky, the entire image or the paint. I'm displaced, abandoned, small, but amazed. Paint is slathered on, an, on in an aggressive manner to simulate the power of the untamed force of nature. The ground Stephen has provided melts below your feet and pushes you further into uncertainty. Beautiful washes and drip splatters of paint captivate and hold our curiosity. What kind of bay storm is this? It's an emotive paint storm, so stop worrying about representation. Sit back, feel, and enjoy the process, beauty, and end and, and results of this masterfully handed painting, handled painting. Um, Mayor Tijin's uh, piece is the next one I'm going to talk about. Mayor. All right, so uh, Mayor's process involves recycling. It's environmentally conscious. Or sorry, conscientious. Uh, her materials are often salvaged, altered, and repurposed. 
By this way of working and creating alone is demonstrating that earth matters. She takes it a step further when her beautiful and well-balanced geometric designs point to controversial issues of limited resources that alter and deteriorate the world we live in. A handrail is chopped down into multiples and deemed fuel tanks by title. Is the little red triangle that rests atop perhaps a vessel dropping fuel off to Washington State's largest refinery? If so, <laughs> then why does it take the form of a sailboat instead of a tanker? It's blazing red and rising high from a white dilapidated tower. Perhaps it's not a boat, but a reference to the Cherry Point Fire of 2012 a seemingly minor local event that speaks largely of the challenges associated with fossil fuel consumption and its impact on the environment, not only in the rest of the states, but worldwide. Working with fossil fuels is messy business, as the white splatter of paint suggests. That little guy right there. <laughs> the tanks the tanks find their way uh, to the pure blocks of blue that may symbolize the disaster where oil meets water, which seem all too recent and familiar. The edge of the bottom layer of the landscape is a lighter blue. Yeah, this side right here. Perhaps it represents the seemingly undisturbed river of groundwater that has no boundaries and once tainted could have disastrous implications. What appears to be in question is whether or not our dependency of fuel is worth sacrificing our fresh water supply and the rest of the environment. Then again, maybe we should give the other side a chance and forget everything I just said. It's really about the virtue of, of progress made possible by oil, the beauty of geometry expressed in the forms of tanks that support it, and the benevolent plutocratic oligarchy it supports. <laughs> However you end up looking at it, Mayer's work is visually appealing, wooden placard worthy of careful consideration. Uh, Pat Carneal. Pat's collage, or should I say petri dish growing Gaia or Earth is interestingly presented as if on scientific display with a large plexiglass surround and little pieces of debris or small developing growths surrounding the celestial form. The Earth appears to matter, but in what fashion? Is Gaia or the Earth an experiment being conducted by another god? The artwork looks as if the creation of Earth has been haphazardly constructed. It's almost put together like the ball of lint that's formed in the dryer. Only the results here are much more attractive and beautiful. Is Earth's formation an accident or nonsensical as the process of collage related to the Dada art movement suggests? Does Earth really matter in the vast universe or is it like the ball of lint that needs to be removed and disposed of? There are too many questions that still remain without definitive answers. Better let Gaia keep, work, keep at it for at least a little longer. She may uh, yet yield desirable results. All right, here. All right, so in Karsten's sculpture arose, we become privy to the process of not only artistic creation, but the creation of earth and perhaps life. It rises and unfolds like the plant that grows with the sun. The sinuous steel bends, twists, and grows out of a hot molten state where its beautifully pitted surface was forced to its expansion limits in the deep earth. Now it exists in a solid, almost fossilized, frozen state, reminding us of the intense heat that exists within the Earth's core and Karsten's furnace. It was born of fire and can only be destroyed by fire. With the presence of a large, oversized signature right here, We see that God, I mean artist, responsible for this creation, has a name and it should be remembered, as it's written not in stone but steel. 
All right, so the award winners is a, the next pieces I would like to talk about. Um, remember that when looking at a work of art, there are different kinds of interpretation and judgment. There's the artist's intent and how they see their own work, how you see the work, how the greater collective public views the work, and most importantly, of course, how the juror, or should I say expert, interprets and judges the work. <laughs> Which is all that really matters in the end, right? No. <laughs> all right. So I believe that art at its best, art is at its best not only when it's at formal peak of beauty or when its concept is brilliant, but when the two join in perfect harmony. It's at its best when you can't think of a better way for it to take shape or be expressed. It's when the work cannot be argued with and instead you submit to the wonder and power of its existence. For me to be completely engaged and blown away, an artwork must be seductive, intelligent, and keep me coming back for more. Kind of like my wife. All right, so. <laughs> the works I chose for awards couple aesthetics with ideas that I thought best fit the Earth's Matter theme. So Lesh, uh, Schnick, his roots was a part of that, with, which was the piece that uh, I discussed earlier in that back little gallery space. Uh, so Sandra Afoot, uh, is she here? What's that? Offit. Offit, sorry. Uh, is she here? All right, so Endurance, um, which is the, the painting right here. All right. We don't need anybody to hold it up. So Sandra's painting Endurance could have easily been displayed as a diptych with her other painting of the same dimensions in this exhibi exhibition, Hope which is back in that other room. They both depict a lush, fertile, and beautiful forest bathed in warm, glowing light. Painterly transitions in color and stroke moves one's eyes lovingly throughout each space and object. In endurance, we find and feel the presence of a lone, erect tree centrally located within the painting. Like in Les's roots, we see red on a tree, but instead of suffering, here the red could be seen as a symbol of virile vitality, as the dominant form and title may suggest. It can be assumed that the force will grow and multiply, as, be, as can be seen in the companion painting, Hope by the Union and Embrace, of two happy trees. So go back and look at that other painting, okay? When looking at endurance, the Earth's bounty is all around you. Despite all the tragedy and gloomy environmental forecasts we find in the news, here is a reminder of the thriving growth that exists here and now in the Northwest. It will hopefully continue with our help by way of green living and with continuing support for state and national parklands. The painting and its presentation are saying that this beauty is worth all possible efforts of preservation and maintenance. If the health of the environment endures, we shall expect to do so as well. This large painting's optimistic promise was a refreshing and beautiful perspective on why Earth matters. So uh, I think Kim was appealing to the jurors' Wisconsin origins by submitting her entitled work, Snow Mapping. Actually, not really, since I don't miss the snow or cold at all. And yet, indirectly, that is perhaps what this work seems to be about, missing snow. Kim's encaustic work is quite alluring, and it's kind of unfair that she gets two chances to show it off with the entry of a diptych. Why two? Why intentionally make a division or distinction between the two? The gap between the panels creates a break in the ice that provides a reason to rethink the terrain. The division is there to create a comparison from one to the other. In mapping snow, it's all about comparison. It's a question of where is the snow now and where has it been so we may know where it's going. I'm reminded of the Etruscans and how they looked for omens in nature. What will the weather patterns tell us as we use a scientific lens instead of a mystical one? The skillful use of the circle suggests precision and accuracy is an important part of mapping and collecting data so that a successful analysis may be formed. 
When the scientific process is applied to natural weather phenomena such as snow, a more definitive answer about climate change may be concluded. The black and negative space on the left panel seems to be representative of the void. It's a place where snow is not. On the right panel, we see another blackened void, but this is less organic in form and plots in geometric fashion predictions of what is to come. Although beautiful in line, texture, and contrast, the sample of vegetation found within this void is less promising as it's devoid of the color of plant life. Green, right? Okay. Both voids suggest that the lack of snow, uh, sorry, both voids suggest the lack of snow, but are also suggestive of the unclear and ominous looking future that may lie ahead if current snow mapping is accurate. We may be on as thin of ice as the layer of enca encaustic portends. If you can't see the receding snow and ice pack firsthand, enjoy the depth and alluring surfaces of Kim's masterfully crafted encaustic work. I awarded best in show to Gloria's environmental artwork, yes, and dot, dot, dot. When I asked the artwork if it should receive the award for best in show, and if it truly believed that Earth matters, it then responded in magic eight ball fashion with a yes. How could I argue with that? Now seriously, when looking at the formal elements of this photo, it's difficult to find anything disagreeable. The image seems perfect. The composition, contrast, and details are spot on and is beautifully presented with a simple white matte and thin black frame that enhances the almost gray monochromatic presence of the landscape. However, this artwork is more than a beautiful photo in a frame. It's about a process that extends beyond the frame's borders one that seems to change locations, shapes, and ideas based on the other works of art Gloria has submitted to the show. In another similar work that appears to be a part of the series, she shouts, asking, how can art help? With all letters in all caps. The appropriate bumper sticker slogan in response is that art saves lives. Yet it is a serious question that the artist or individual is burdened with and must consider when wanting change for the better. It's especially overwhelming when that desired change is against the economic interests of the plutocracy. At first glance, the white forms of yes and dot 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 appeared to be feathers carefully placed to form the letters in the landscape in an Andy Goldsworthian fashion. After closer inspection, I noticed that they were white gloves, which are normally used to handle items of high value. They're also symbolic of the white glove treatment, which provides first-class care and service. When placed in the context of the landscape, they are representative of people as caretakers of the earth. We should handle the environment with white gloves. We should perhaps give Mother Nature the white glove treatment instead of the usual individuals who receive this service and that are also responsible for its demise. Gloria, with her limited resources, is most likely doing her best to do what she can to care and service the environment by creating art that can, and more importantly, does help. There's a slightly darker and more sinister interpretation that can be found within the work. The illuminating light and heavy atmosphere found in the landscape adds both mysticism and mystery, which brings into question what lies beyond the foreground. It could be a reference to the unknown future that is obscured by either a more optimistic cloud or an ominous smog. The word yes appears as if it were a large Hollywood sign, making the fog read as smog. Going even deeper and darker into the artwork's reading is the title of the work, which is yes and dot dot dot. The ellipsis in the title suggests that some part of our ability to understand what is going on has been omitted, as we are then left with unanswered questions and an awkward silence.